is Dr. Jeff Mitchum from the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, so please give him um, a welcome. Okay, this is going to be a little different. The Big Men region has received a lot of attention from archaeologists at various times, but until recently, research has been pretty sporadic. To keep this presentation manageable, I decided to concentrate on the three people mentioned in the title, but there are many others who dabbled or carried out work in the region over the years. I've had a, uh, a major interest in the history of Florida archaeology for decades, and I've devoted special attention to several individuals. The following remarks are largely derived from my studies of notes, collections, archives, and even family members. Due to time constraints, I'm limiting the Big Ben to Franklin, Wakulla, Taylor, Jefferson, and Leon counties, so just ignore the other counties on there. Um, there are also a number of other researchers who worked in this region in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but there's not time to include all of them. The first re researcher I want to discuss is Clarence Bloomfield Moore. In the late 1990s, I edited two volumes of, of reprints of his Florida papers for the University of Alabama Press. Ironically, the Big Ben was not included in the volumes I edited, but was in a third one compiled by David Brose and Nancy White. I've, con I've continued some research on Moore in subsequent years, and just under a year ago, this ramped up considerably. Lawrence Ayton, a retired Washington, D.C. National Park Service archaeologist who grew up in Florida, contacted me last October. He's had a long-term, nearly obsessive uh, interest in Moore, and he had begun working on a detailed bi biography of Moore using an amazing amount of material that he gathered over decades of research. But unfortunately, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease some years ago, and it began affecting him more severely in the last few years. His physical health had deteriorated significantly, and it was starting to affect his cognitive abilities. Uh, we had met some years ago, and he, he thought that I might be interested in helping him finish the book as a co-author. Uh, after going through some of his research materials, I agreed to be the junior author, and he had, he had already uh, he already had a detailed outline and had begun writing some sections. I, I shipped 12 boxes of materials to my office in Arkansas and began absorbing some of the information. But unfortunately, I received word that Larry died in June of this year, so I'm, I'm going on to complete the book. <clears throat> Among the massive amount of material or a number of wonderful photographs of him at different stages in his life, but because this talk is being filmed, I didn't include them. Uh, partly because I don't have copyright clearance on all of them, but also I don't want them to get, I don't want to get scooped before the book comes out. <laughs> Well, all, all of this intense exposure to Clarence B. Moore has given me some, some insights into his mind and his personality. He was truly wealthy and devoted to his hobby or avocation of excavating archaeological sites just to see what was there. I realize that many of us hes hesitate to call what he did archaeology, but nobody can argue that he didn't publish his findings. With his specially outfitted steamboat, he traveled the coasts and rivers. Hey, it's doing it to me, too. He traveled the coasts and rivers of, of the southeast, digging in any site that, where he could get um, permission. This mode of transportation and the methods employed mean that most of his work was along rivers or the coast. 
His usual yearly schedule was to write his reports and submit them for publication in the warm part of the year while spending the colder months digging. He had a crew of African-American workers who did the digging, and he especially liked some who lived in Sop Choppy in Wakulla County, and he tried to hire them every year, and they were very thankful for that. In the warm months, his boat captain, Josiah Raybon, would visit the areas selected for digging, searching for mounds and contacting landowners to secure permission, often paying them. He didn't dig at all in Leon or Jefferson counties, and he only spent time in the Big Bend in 1902, 1903, and 1918. Almost all of the sites more worked on in this region were Whedon Island burial mounds, most with Swift Creek and, and Deptford components. Only a handful had any Fort Walton occupation. He dug 27 sites here in 1902, but only one in 1903 and seven in 1918. Sites in Wakulla and Franklin counties included Pierce Mounds, which yielded lots of unusual and amazing amazingly decorated pottery, uh, pottery vessels, and Tucker Mound, which included Whedon Island bird effigies and intricately decorated pots. The Hall Mound at Panacea had an unbelievable uh, array of indescribable vessel forms and bird effigies. At Mound Field, there were tons, there were lots of Excuse me. At Moundfield, there were lots of bird effigies. It's an understatement to note that he was bitten by the Whedon Island bug, as so many of us have been. His publications at the time are filled with illustrations of the incredible ceramic artwork he recovered from those sites. The skill of his diggers is evident in their recovering most of these vessels undamaged. What differentiated more from typical looters was not only his lavish publications, but also his lack of a profit motive and his generosity to many different museums and institutions. As I mentioned before, he was extremely wealthy, so he had no interest in selling the artifacts. And even though he lived in a large house in Philadelphia, he didn't have the room to curate all of, all of the material, nor did he have a place to dis display it. At first, he donated the artifacts to the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia, the institution that was publishing his reports as issues of their journal. He paid for the publication of the issues containing his reports, and he also gave them donations to help pay for curation. Before long, they just they ran out of room and had to stop accepting them. So he began to dispo, uh, bestow collections on other institutions. He maintained a friendship with Frederick Ward Putnam, the director of the Harvard Peabody Museum, and Putnam gave him suggestions on institutions to whom he should offer materials. And most were very happy to accept them. And this is how his collections got so scattered about making, studying them a really complicated chore. Clarence Moore did make some lasting contributions beyond just illustrating interesting artifacts. <clears throat> In terms of Whedon Island burial mounds, he noticed his observation that these sites usually have deposits of pottery on the east side. He, he was also the first to publish the observation of, quote, killing or basically perforating vessels before burial. Concerning the east side deposits, he was almost gleeful in his observation that so many of the earlier looters had dug fruitlessly in the center of mounds searching for pottery caches. In addition to illustrating so many Whedon Island vessels, Moore also included many photos of exquisite Swift Creek complicated pottery, noting, it, <clears throat> noting its presence in most of the mounds 
along with the distinctive Whedon Island pottery. It's strange that this common co-occurrence has often been ignored or overlooked in subsequent reports and syntheses, at least until recently. As so many of us have noted, we must be grateful for Moore simply because his descriptions and the associated collections are often the only records we have of so many sites that no longer exist. I want to shift the discussion now to Elias H. Sellards. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the field of archaeology in Florida was unorganized with the occasional northern scholars and local collectors digging or carrying out research in relative isolation. It was sort of a frontier situation where there were, where there were no rules or ethical standards. With the exception of Clarence B. Moore, few of the researchers published the results of their investigations, and a number of substantial collections were exported to northern institutions. There was no state archaeologist or state agency charged with overseeing or managing archaeological sites in Florida. Ironically, it was a geologist who started paying official attention to the state's archaeological resources, albeit, albeit grudgingly. The first state geologist was E.H. Sellards, best remembered by most archaeologists as the excavator of the famed Vero site. Where he, where he found human remains and artifacts in possible association with the bones of extinct Pleistocene animals. The Florida State Geological Survey was established in 1907, and, Yale, and the Yale University educated Sellards was hired as the first state geologist. His primary mission was to supervise a survey of the geology of the state. But the reality was that he and his ass assistants were also documenting other natural resources, including animals, plants, and artifacts. In looking over Sellers' correspondence in the files of the, Ge of the Florida Geological Survey, it's clear that he was often getting letters and visits from citizens asking questions about archaeological sites or wanting to have artifacts identified. Then, as now, many people had no idea of the distinction between archaeologists, paleontologists, and geologists. In general, Sellard's sole interest in archaeology was in Paleo-Indians. But out of necessity, he learned a little more about Florida archaeology, mainly from reading the published works of Clarence B. Moore and the few other articles on the subject available at that time. The number of archaeological inquiries increased after the excavations at Vero in 1916, largely because of the extensive press coverage of those finds. But Sellards was not trained in archaeology, and he usually just referred people to Moore's works. I don't want to go into great detail on the Vero project, but it was a significant discovery that caused a great deal of scientific controversy and press attention. Sellards was contacted in 1913 by some residents of Vero Beach who had collected well-preserved Pleistocene fossils from a canal that was being dug there. A couple of years later, the collectors reported human bones from the same stratum as the faunal bones. And more, more bones and some artifacts showed up the next year, and Sellards traveled to examine the site. And he, under, he undertook excavations in 1916 and published various articles claiming to have found human remains in direct association with Pleistocene animal remains. And this produced immediate blowback from other scientists while simultaneously garnering support from others. As import, an important fact about Sellards is that he disliked controversy and avoided it, especially in publications. The criticism directed at him during the Vero de debates affected him deeply and undoubtedly influenced his decision to move to Texas a few years later. <laughs> 
In all of his publications about Vero, he took care to explain the stratigraphic situation in great detail and tried to ad address each of the criticisms direct directed at him. But unfortunately, it was decades before radiocarbon dating or other techniques would be developed that might have helped him argue his case. His principal adversary was Alesh Herdlichka, a strong-willed, opinionated physical anthropologist for the U.S. National Museum at the Smithsonian Institution. An immigrant from Czechoslovakia at the age of 12, Herdlichka was likewise a tireless and prolific worker. Trained in medicine, he's generally regarded as the father of American physical anthropology. He studied living populations from North American archaeological, uh, oh, I'm sorry, he, he studied living populations on every continent, continent except Antarctica and amassed huge, huge amounts of data on skeletal remains from North American archaeological sites which he published in numerous books and articles. Sellards was successful in setting up the Florida Geological Survey, a state agency that continues to this day. He headed the survey until 1919 when he resigned and went to work for the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas. He became director of that bureau in 1932, serving until 1945. He was also professor of geology from 1926 until 1945. And in 1938, he also became the director of the Texas Memorial Museum, a position he held until 1957, when he retired at age 82 to, to devote more time to writing. A tireless worker, he wrote or co-authored 150 publications over a span of 60 years before his death in 1961. The job of carrying out a survey of a state's geology was too large for one person, so Sellards hired some assistants, one of whom was Herman Gunter, who then became state, state geologist in 1919 when Sellards took the job in Texas. A few years into his tenure, tenure he was introduced to a young man who was an extraordinary self-taught naturalist. That young man was James Clarence Simpson. Simpson was born in 1910 in Micanopy and raised in High Springs in Alachua County. He was the son of Henry H. and Katie Mather Simpson and had an older brother and a younger sister. Clarence was an avid out, outdoorsman from a young age and, and as were his parents and siblings. In the fall of 1920, Clarence found his first arrowhead and began searching for them wherever he went. By the, by the following year, his entire family had become nearly obsessed with Indian artifacts and spent most of their spare time collecting from sites all over north central Florida, both on dry land and in rivers. Clarence's mother, shown here, wrote six brief articles about some of their finds, which were published in 1935 and 1936 in Hobbies magazine. Although Clarence had no formal education beyond high school, he became an expert in several fields, paleontology, archaeology, zoology, and in various aspects of geology. His expertise and the regard in which he was held by other scholars is revealed in correspondence in the Florida Geological Survey files. These, there are letters from most of the archaeologists working in Florida in the first half of the 20th century. John Griffin, John Goggin, Hale Smith, Ripley Bullen, and others. For the most part, these letters are requesting information on archaeological sites or asking Clarence to identify animal bones or other items that were sent to him. Other letters from such out-of-state scholars as the Harvard zoologist Thomas Barber and archaeologist Matthew Sterling of the Smithsonian Institution demonstrate that his renown extended well beyond the state. 
He also became well known for, making, for the making of casts of fossils and, it, and was in demand from various agencies for this. Clarence, or Bruce as he was known to friends, was first officially hired by the Florida Geological Survey at the age of 20 in 1930, though he had been collaborating with Herman Gunter since he was 16 years old. Much of his work was mundane geological work in various parts of the state, recording well data or carrying out soil or mineral studies, but he rarely missed an opportunity to get involved in paleontological or archeological projects. Herman Gunner supported him in this, and both were involved in, in high-profile underwater excavations of a mastodon skeleton from Wakulla Springs in 1930 and 1931. That's Clarence on the right, and Herman Gunner is the man in the hat and glasses next to him. Actually, it was more just a recovery operation than an excavation using a diving platform and a hand pump air system for divers. The bones were later reconstructed and are on display in the Florida Museum of Natural History in Tallahassee. It's important to remember that when Clarence first began working for the Florida Geological Survey, it was during the Great Depression. As the country's financial woes deepened, state agencies were also experiencing deep funding cuts, and this meant reduced salaries or cutbacks to part-time. This necessitated Clarence leaving the FGS in 1933 to take a position with the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey in the Tampa area, and he stayed in this job for about a year. It was during this period that Franklin D. Roosevelt began, cre began creating relief agencies that had a profound effect on archaeology in the southeast and other parts of the country. One of the first was the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, FERA, um, and through the programs of this agency, some short-term archaeological projects were funded in Florida. Several projects in the Panhandle were under the direction of Vernon Lamb, who was to become Florida's first state archaeologist in 1935. Uh, Clarence went to work for Lamb on at least one of these projects, which employed large crews of unskilled laborers. In subsequent years, Clarence recounted an incident where Lamb bought moonshine whiskey and got most of the crew very drunk, causing a scandal in the area around Panacea. <laughs> Lamb directed one project in Jefferson County at the Calico Hill site. This was a FIRA project that hired a number of teenage boys. And this project was notorious for Lamb reportedly buying whiskey and getting his, his crew drunk. And Simpson may have been referring to this incident, which he thought occurred in Wakulla County. But many of the artifacts from the, from the Calico Hill project disappeared. Um, this effigy was supposedly found there, but later went missing. And a, a cast is... Uh, in the Florida Museum of Natural History and detailed drawings and photographs were done, but I think it's definitely a fake. Although Clarence didn't care for Lamb, that's an understatement, uh, financial necessity took precedence and he was employed by Lamb in at least two privately funded projects in 1935, one at the Fountain of Youth site in St. Augustine and another near the town of Eustace in central Florida. Obviously, Lamb recognized Clarence's skills but ultimately did not pay him all of the salary he was due. Uh, Lamb was unbelievable. It's a whole different story. In disgust, Clarence returned to work for the Florida Geological Survey. Now, it was in 1935 that the Works Prog Progress Administration, or WPA, was established. The WPA funded several major archaeological projects in Florida. Because Vernon Lamb had arranged to have himself appointed state archaeologist, he was initially Florida's person in charge of these projects, which were officially carried out in conjunction with the Smithsonian Institution. 
Herman Gunter and others, though, were concerned about the situation and were relieved somewhat when Clarence was hired to direct several of the projects in the Tampa Bay area. And it's interesting to read Clarence's correspondence from that time. Living in Tampa and managing the ongoing archaeological, uh, archaeological projects there was challenging, especially since the WPA funding came and went very suddenly. One of his letters to Herman Gunner early in the project describes some of the conditions and expresses his unhappiness with the, with the situation. Quote, I am supervisor of the, Hills, of the Hillsborough County project, a mound 400 feet across, and by the house post we found on top, I think it's a ceremonial mound. I have 80 men working, mostly very old men, and I'm making it as easy as possible on them. The, the salary is $100 a month, and I don't like it here at all, but I feel that I can increase my knowledge as well as make myself a better man because of the experience. I don't think I care to stay here over a few months, and if you really need me, I'll come back to Tallahassee immediately. <laughs> if, if not, I'll stay for two or three months, then with your permission, I will come back to the survey. So you can tell he wanted to get back up here. Uh, end quote. His, his desire to return to Tallahassee quick, quickly went unfulfilled as he stayed more than two years taking over as acting state archaeologist when Vernon Lamb was suspended for alleged financial improprieties. <laughs> I wish I had time to tell you about those. They're pretty amazing. <laughs> Cla Clarence's letters to Gunner and others describe the terrible plight of most of the workers, many of whom were absolutely destitute. They also shed light on the collaborative association with the Smithsonian Institution, which was not a particularly good relationship from the Florida point of view. Clarence did not get along very well with Preston Holder, the Smithsonian's representative on most of the Hillsborough County projects, though he did speak highly of Lloyd Reichard, who, who supervised some of the Manatee County projects. The artifacts from the excavations were divided 50-50 between the state of, our, of Florida and the Smithsonian Institution, and de deciding which artifacts went, went to each was a point of contention. And it ultimately proved to be a terrible decision from the archaeological point of view because it made analysis and reporting of the excavations especially difficult, if not impossible. Although the supervision of the Hillsborough County projects was taxing, Clarence's time in Tampa was not completely unhappy. He met and married Zelma Harris there, and his first child was born in 1937. He ultimately had three. In 2004, I was privileged to meet Zelma in person. She was actually still alive. Uh, at a Florida Anthropological Society meeting, a colleague told me that a visitor to the Whedon Island Preserve Cultural and Natural History Center mentioned that she had grown up with Clarence's younger da youngest daughter. Through this woman, I was put in touch with Joanne Cornegay, shown on the right here, Clarence's youngest daughter, and my wife and I visited Joanne and Zelma for a day at their homes near M Mariana. Along with providing a lot of information and some photographs of Clarence, I was able to, s to see three things that he had made. Uh, a bone projectile point, a point chip from manganese glass, and an exquisitely carved alligator pendant made from what is probably ivory. Um, Joanne also has a delightful pencil cartoon, which you may not really be able to see here, that Clarence drew of some of the mound excavations. Uh, it's entitled, A Busy Day at the Mound, and it depicts the excavated skeletons thumbing their noses at the archeologists or having coffee with them. <laughs> when the WPA projects ended, Clarence returned to Tallahassee where he worked for the Florida Geological Survey, except for a few years as superintendent of Florida Cavern State Park at Mariana. 
The WPA project funding included no provisions for analysis or reporting, so it was years before some reports got written and many remain unanalyzed. Gordon Willey included reports on the Thomas Mound and Cockroach Key sites in his 1949 book, and Ripley Bullen used Clarence's notes to publish a summary report, report on the 11 Hillsborough County WPA sites in 1952. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Clarence suffered from chronic health problems throughout his life. Many of the letters in the, in the FGS files detail his periods of illness, doctor visits, and hospitalizations. Uh, J. Clarence Simpson died on March 29, 1952. By the time of his death, state-supported archaeology in Florida had shifted from the Florida Geological Survey to the Florida Park Service. But Clarence's contributions to our knowledge of Florida archaeology should not be underestimated. The results of his WPA work aided Willie's development of pottery typologies, and his family collection of some 13,000 artifacts is still a valuable resource at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Ripley Bullen even named a Paleo-Indian projectile point type in his honor, which I'm sure most of you knew. Studying Clarence B. Moore has made me respect him as a man of, of integrity, and I hope that his biography will adequately express that and help others to appreciate his contributions as well. E. H. Sellards is known and respected for his contributions to archaeology, even though he was a geologist by training. Once he moved to Texas, along with a distinguished research career in several sub-disciplines of geology, he was able to carry out important, successful investigations of several Clovis and Folsom sites, including the well-known Blackwater Draw site in New Mexico. When I studied the Florida Geological Surveys and related uh, survey archives and related documents, I learned that Clarence Simpson was truly a remarkable man, and he was instrumental in the development of state-supported archaeology in Florida. It's largely due to his care and concern for the data that we know as much as we do about the WPA projects in the Tampa Bay area. Although I had read, read several of the articles he published, I'd never given much thought to who he was or his background. And meeting his wife and one of his daughters was an unexpected pleasure, and through them, I now feel that I know him. At its core, archaeology is about people, and it's people who do archaeology. Delving into archives and records to learn more about our archaeological predecessors has been a fascinating endeavor, and it's helped me to learn a lot about Florida archaeology in general. As a result, I feel like I understand a lot more about the archaeology in different parts of the state. Thank you.